So you've released this statement. Um, what are your main concerns, uh, particularly following the arrests of uh, Chinono and Ngarivumwe? Uh, we're mainly concerned with um, the human rights violation. Um, obviously, these arrests come in the wake of um, certain tweets that uh, are alleged to have been made by the two. And uh, we believe that, um, that there's an issue of the breach of freedom of expression and freedom of assembly. Right. Um, bear in mind that um, there is a demonstration that uh, people are calling for. So are we saying that um, you can't write anything on Twitter that the government doesn't like? Otherwise, you may face arrest. It looks like it. But it shouldn't be. All right. So which sections of the Constitution have particularly have been violated uh, by the authorities? Section 61 of the Constitution guarantees the right to freedom of expression. Um, essentially, people have the right to express themselves, exchange ideas, share information. Um, as long as they are not sharing hate speech or inciting violence. So are the courts being complicit or are they misapplying the laws? Because the police have been citing Section 187.1a, read with Section 37.1a of the Criminal Law Codification and Reform Act. And I just wonder how the Constitution plays, if they can use the Constitution, the law, um, to arrest uh, these two? Well, um, those particular sections um, uh, talk about inciting violence. Mm. Um, and um, you can be arrested if you do incite violence. But in this case, they're being arrested. Uh, one of them is apparently one of the organizers for the, um, the demonstration. And the other one, who is the journalist, uh, has been arrested for expressing support. So in essence, the police have arrested them for organizing a demonstration, not for inciting violence, because the tweets that they are alleged to have made don't actually talk about violence at all. So again, I'm going to ask you, are the, is the court system being uh, misused? Are, are the courts... Uh, complicit in what the authorities are trying to do because if, um, if if what you're saying is true then the judge should have seen this and immediately said but hang on there are no grounds to bring these people before us yes that's what we actually think because um, from the on the face of it before you even go into the basics of the case just on the face of it there's no offense so tell me about the trends that you've been seeing as the uh, uh, Southern African Litigation Center uh, happening over time. What kind of cases are falling on your desk at this stage? Well, um, we have actually issued a number of statements regarding things that are happening in Zimbabwe. Uh, the abductions that are alleged to have been done, um, arrests of lawyers and um, opposition leaders, um, you know, the use of uh, COVID laws to suppress dissent. And uh, we're, we're really concerned with the fact that um, it seems that the state is really um, stifling the rights of the people in Zimbabwe, rights that are guaranteed in terms of the constitution. So I keep coming back to the courts because one would think that uh, the courts are independent of the state uh, in that they are another arm and they, they uh, do not, um, are not supposedly biased towards anybody. But it sounds as if the courts are part of the machinery that's being used to um, justify these kinds of arrests and uh, harassment. It would look like that. Um, one hopes that um, if these cases uh, are brought, you know, to trial, um, when evidence is brought to light, uh, you hope that the court will exercise its independence. 
Um, what has actually happened is of great concern to everybody who is observing the situation. So denying them bail, that was up to the courts, wasn't it? And they've chosen yes. to keep them in jail for supposedly a case that really doesn't have legs. That suggests also, again, um, perhaps unfairness? Yes, it does. Um, if we, usually when bail is denied, it has to be with good reason, because in terms of the Constitution, bail is a right and can only be denied uh, where there are compelling circumstances. And so one would have expected that um, the reasons for the denial of bail would be very strong. And uh, from the reports, um, it wouldn't look that way. Um, it looks like, um, you know, the issue of the presumption of innocence might have been overlooked in this case. We hope that the High Court uh, will be able to relook into the matter and um, give the right decision. All right. And perhaps finally, what is your call then to Zimbabwe's authorities and also, I guess, regional bodies like SADAC and even continental bodies like the AU? with the situation, particularly with these two, but also what they represent in terms of what looks like a general problem? Yes, um, well, we have the mechanisms, we have the rules, we have the laws. Uh, we, Zimbabwe, as well as um, countries within the African Union and SADC, have all uh, got um, obligations that they put themselves in. They are signatories to the African Charter, they are signatories to the UN Declaration of Human Rights. All we ask for is that the government of Zimbabwe complies with its obligations in terms of its own constitution, in terms of the international obligations that it has. We ask that um, Zimbabwe's neighbors and Zimbabwe's peers in the region continue to remind um, the government of Zimbabwe that um, it's within their best interests to comply with the law that um, they are subscribing to as well.